this lecture. Um, I'm so happy that you took the time out of your busy schedule um, to come here to get a better understanding of this devastating disease that is affecting everybody. Um, the weirdest part about Alzheimer's is that uh, through all the research that's being carried out, there is no cure at the moment. Um, they're still trying to find a cure for it. They're still trying to find pinpoint what specifically caused Alzheimer's disease. Um, I think the most confusing part about it is because it affects persons across all race. You can't say, okay, it's more popular in blacks versus whites versus, you know, there's, it does, Alzheimer's doesn't have a face. And also it affects persons regardless of whether they were a teacher, a doctor, a farmer, it doesn't matter. Um, Alzheimer's disease is very progressive as well. And because of the increase in numbers that we've been seeing, not only here in Antigua, but across the world, it is imperative that persons become educated and become aware of this um, debilitating disease. In addition to that, um, it is affecting persons younger and younger. So they've had cases of persons as young as age 40, yeah, being diagnosed with um, Alzheimer's disease. Um, Alzheimer's disease is the most popular type of dementia, so it falls under the umbrella of um, one of the dementia. So it, is, it accounts for 70% of the dementia cases. So I am glad that you could come here today to not only um, celebrate, well, not only to build awareness about Alzheimer's disease and the fact that September is World Alzheimer's Month, um, but also to educate yourself, enlighten yourself, and gain a better understanding of how this disease is affecting um, persons. Um, today, our speakers, we're so happy to have um, Dr. Georgette Mead. Um, she's a cardiologist, um, internal medicine as well. When she comes, she will also tell you a little bit more about herself as well. Um, we also have Dr. Tadia Smith. Um, she's also a medical doctor, and she works a lot, a lot with um, elderly clients as well. She also volunteers at the hospice. Um, Dr. Smith will give you a little bit more insight about herself as well. Um, we also have neurologist Dr. Gaden Osborne from the Mount St. John Medical Center. Um, we're happy to have him here to take time out to give us a little bit more knowledge about the, um, this disease condition. And we also have with us um, wellness and Zumba instructor, Iridania Francis as well. Um, she is one of the instructors at the nursing home. She also teaches Zumba, she's a certified Zumba trainer, and um, also trained with persons, to deal with persons with dementia as well. And so we're happy to have all our guests here. Um, I don't want to keep you any longer. So without further ado, um, we will welcome our first speaker, um, Dr. Georgette Mead. Good evening, everyone. I'm so pleased with this turnout. I'm, yes, I'm probably need more chairs. But Alzheimer's, <laughs> yeah. Alzheimer's disease is very near and dear to me. And um, I was, I am a member of the Alzheimer's Disease Association. I was there in the formative days of it. But then I went on to do my cardiology fellowship. So I'm back home now um, as Antigua's cardiologist. And my first specialization was internal medicine. So my talk to you today will be on heart disease and aging. So heart disease develops because of a lot of preventable risk factors, but along with that, just the fact of aging and degeneration, we have changes in our heart function. So I'll go a little bit into that tonight. I'll be doing like an overview. Um, so I'll get started now. So heart disease is pretty extensive 
But what I tried to do was narrow it down to like some major subgroups, like the most common causes of heart disease. And so coronary artery disease is the number one cause of death worldwide, um, cardiovascular disease in general. But if we were to break it down even further, coronary artery disease is the number one cause. And what is that? So the heart arteries, so coronary artery, so the heart arteries that supply blood to the muscles of the heart is what we call the coronary arteries. And so they become blocked due to plaque deposition. You might have heard of atherosclerosis um, leading to heart attacks. Um, this is what the coronary artery disease is. And then there is cardiomyopathy. And these are diseases that affect the muscles of the heart. So this is the muscular areas of the heart. Um, they can become thickened or it may become dilated. And then the patient can progress to what we call congestive heart failure. The other kind of broad group is the valvular heart disease. And these are the valves. There are four of them. I refer to them as the, they're like swinging doors. So they swing open to allow blood from the upper chamber to the lower chamber on both sides, the atrium to the ventricle. And sometimes they may become stenosed. Basically, they're not opening as they should. They're not opening wide as they should. Or when they're supposed to be in the closed state, they don't close completely and blood can go back in, into the upper chamber. So that's how we get the valvular disease. Arrhythmias are basically abnormal heart rhythms. You might have heard of tachycardia or bradycardia. Tachy means fast, bradycardia the slow heart rates. And I'll go in a bit more in terms of how aging might cause these. Um, but patients sometimes need pacemakers, sometimes ICDs to help with the overall heart function. So the arrhythmias is an issue really with the electrical function of the heart. And heart failure then can be on the background of all of the above subgroups I mentioned earlier. And at this point, the heart is now unable to meet the demands of the body. The main function of the heart is to push oxygenated blood out through the aorta. And then the aorta is the main artery in the body. And then it branches off to the kidney, the brain, etc. So patients present now with shortness of breath leg swelling, unable to lay down flat, getting tired very easily. And these are some of the symptoms of congestive heart failure. So L aging, so heart disease, so cardiovascular disease is the most frequent single cause of death in persons of over the age of 65. So along with dementia, there is heart disease and another long list of ailments, unfortunately. And so, but in terms of the cause of death, cardiovascular disease is the number one factor. And what they found that with increasing age, coronary artery disease is more pre prevalent, arrhythmia is more prevalent, and heart failure. But it's not only the preventable causes, as I said, just aging leads to cardiovascular disease. So I have this pictorial just to point out. So this is when we're in the younger age group. And each day that passes and each year that passes, our heart goes through quite a bit of changes. Thickening, so if you compare this one to this, you notice that the ventricles, the muscle here, is thicker on this side. And that's whether you have a healthy diet, whether you exercise, don't smoke, it can progress to this um, depending on just the fact of aging. The electrical activity of the heart here is highlighted in the yellow. This is the pathway that causes the heart to contract. And you notice here it's thinned on this side. It goes through a degenerative process. And the thing is, the heart is the only part of the body that works 24-7 every second of the day from birth, even in utero. And so it's doing a lot of work um, throughout our lives. The chamber, as you notice, a bit smaller, the cavity here is smaller because of the thickening. All right, and then as the valves sometimes get calcium on them, the artery, we see plaque being laid down with aging. 
Um, they, the vessel wall is thicker and etc. So definitely we notice a difference and this is just because of the aging process. Just to point out a few other things, um, it becomes thick and even without hypertension, because we know hypertension can lead to an enlarged heart or thickened heart muscle. Um, the valves become calcified, that means calcium de deposit on them, and this is referring to the electrical activity of the heart. The sinoatrial node is called the pacemaker of the heart, and that means that's what gets the electrical activity going and causes the contraction. So by the time I noted, when I was researching, it said by the time the age of 75 years, there's only 10% of the cells that were present at the age of 20 years. And that's why in our 80 year old, 85 year old patients, there's a high need for pacemakers. Most of our patients will be in the higher age group. So how do we screen our nurse treaty wanted me to mention um, how do we detect these? This, the ECG is one of the basic tests. It's readily available. I don't think anyone should reach 60 or even 50 without having an ECG. Um, it's so readily available. Um, it's non-invasive, no pain. And we could identify early signs of any heart disease. So this is basically showing um, um, left ventricular hypertrophy, the thickening I was referring to earlier. And this one is showing one of the arrhythmias called atrial fibrillation, one of the irregular heartbeats. So diastolic dysfunction is on the background of this thickening I was mentioning. Basically, diastole means the heart is relaxing, the left ventricle relaxes to accept blood so that it can then send it to the rest of the body. But there's a dysfunction in that. Why? Because it's now thickened and it's not able to dilate or because of the stiffening that occurs. So that's an issue and patients present with heart failure because of that. So there's an impairment in the relaxation and the filling and you notice there's less blood can fill in this space. The heart arteries also become stiffened and the arteries on the outside. So the aorta, and this is why we, the hypertension is also a problem, we want to keep it under control. Because it's, as I explained to my patients, it's like going to the gym, and your heart is pumping against the high pressures, the, your, your biceps get larger. And it's the same thing that happens to the heart. But you don't want to put the heart under all that strain, because it's gonna fail at some point, and you develop symptoms. So, the blood pressure is important, not only when you're at 60 years, but when you're at 20. 30, 40, etc. The only way you know your blood pressure is to check it. And so I encourage everybody here um, to do so. Coronary artery disease, it's more diffuse with aging. That means it's happening in more than one arteries and different places in the arteries. Uh, just a depiction, a picture here to show you. So in the young age, well, at birth, it's no cholesterol, no plaque. Um, the thickness is normal, the artery line is normal. But as we age, and we, our diet changes more to the Western diet, etc., the plaque is laying down. By your 20, your 30, it's laying down, laying down. And the seat's now narrowed. So that's why by the time you get to 50 years, 60, now I've had patients with heart attacks in their 20s. Yes, in the 20s and early 30s. So we really need to start from our toddlers and even our infants um, to you know, get them into that healthy diet that we're hearing about. And I'll mention a little on that because I didn't want to present without mentioning that. And it's not only in the heart arteries. It's a systemic problem the arteries to the brain leading to stroke, the arteries to the legs leading to peripheral arterial disease, patients requiring amputation. It's a similar process. 
So yes, I'm talking about the heart, but I'm speaking about stroke. I'm speaking about peripheral artery disease. Erectile dysfunction, same. And kidney disease. So what puts us at risk for coronary artery disease? What puts us at risk for dementia? Because there is an overlap with dementia and coronary artery disease. Um, so all these are relevant. Um, diabetes, hypertension, which, let's do a little survey. Who has a family history or personal history of hypertension or diabetes? All right, so this is like, 70% of the room. Yes, it is very frightening because of the complications it can lead to. So we are prone to it. It's on both sides of my family, both of them. So we're all prone to it. And how do we reverse it? And the truth is coronary artery disease is preventable. It is a preventable condition um, by and large. Yes, there's age and genetics that we can't do much about but most of the time, most of it is preventable. So cholesterol, so high cholesterol, being overweight and obese, smoking, lack of exercise. So the American Heart Association recommends 30 minutes of exercise, and this is moderate intensity. So walking at a brisk pace, swimming, jogging, cycling, and these are the aerobic, um, cardio aerobic exercise. So 30 minutes, five times a week. So at least 150 minutes um, overall is what's recommended. Yes, um, osteoarthritis is an issue for some patients or some persons. There are exercises you could do sitting. So um, we're trying to encourage persons to exercise. So there are sitting exercises you could do. Um, the diet. I'll say a bit more of that, and excessive alcohol use. So alcohol in itself can lead to heart disease, heart failure, a dilated heart, but it's really an excess. And I always get the question about the wine, um, so I'll put it in here now. One glass of wine for women per day, red wine, it's not heart protective, but they found it doesn't damage the heart. <laughs> but we're not gonna be encouraged people to have alcohol, because it's a four ounce glass, and many of us, most of us, is not four ounces we're gonna have. So, um, and men are allowed two glasses, so eight ounces. All right, so, um, and the healthy eating plate. Okay, so this is what's known as a healthy eating plate. Half of the plate should be vegetables and fruits. So you can have a salad, um, carrots and broccoli, squash. These are what goes in this section. Um, we like our ground provisions in the Caribbean, but it will go into the quarter here with the grains, the starchy foods. But the grains they recommend are whole grain pasta, brown rice, whole wheat bread. Um, limit white rice, limit white bread. Antiguans do love bread. <laughs> yeah, so it's a small amount. And the healthy protein, fish, poultry, beans, and nuts. Limit red meat. Um, red meat can lead to cancer, so we sort of, you know, even zero now. Sorry about that. So it's fish, poultry, beans, and nuts are the healthy protein. So that's the remaining quarter. So try to get as close to this as possible. Most Caribbean plates have half of the plate being protein. Do you agree? Yeah, so we have quite a bit of shifting of all plates to do. Um, so half of it should be vegetables and fruits. Water, we all know the importance of water. And the healthy oils are the olive oil and the canola oil, or plant-based oils. Atrial fibrillation. Uh, the most common arrhythmia in the elderly. Uh, why we worry about it so much is the risk of stroke. And then there's the entity of vascular dementia. So recurrent stroke, repeated stroke, even strokes that didn't cause you any symptoms can lead to dementia. So all of the risk factors I mentioned earlier, we need to be aware of it. 
if you do have any of them, you want to keep them under control. Because they're chronic diseases, over a long period of time, they could cause these complications. So atrial fibrillation, if that's present, we usually have to put the patient on anticoagulation um, to prevent the risk of a stroke. And the brand arrhythmias, I mentioned this before, sometimes the heart rate can go dangerously low and patients require pacemakers. So the ECG is what is going to indicate this. They might become dizzy, they may faint. These are some symptoms that you might notice and they will definitely need to be evaluated. So they change uh, the degeneration to the electrical activity of the heart because of aging puts them at risk and some medications they might be on. So then they would need to be assessed by their physician um, to see, keep a close eye on them. Now, I mentioned earlier the ECG. That was an arbitrary number of 50, but I think when you do your physical, you should get an ECG at least from 40 years. Um, younger, if cardiac disease is prevalent, if you're a diabetic, hypertensive, everybody should have had an ECG. The echo, I'll show you some pictures of what that is. It's basically an ultrasound of the heart. It's non-invasive, meaning it's painless. It's on the outer part of the body. So ultrasound of the abdomen, ultrasound of the leg, but this test focus on the heart. Um, the chest x-ray, many patients come to see me because there's an enlarged heart in the x-ray. And then get an ECG and they get an echo to determine if it's the thickness of the left ventricle that's causing it or whether it's a dilated heart which may cause them to develop heart failure. And we all would need HbA1c, cholesterol levels, kidney function, liver function, thyroid function, and the complete body count. So these are just some tests that we do just to see the overall heart function. Now, the echo, I just got some images just to reinforce because LVH is pretty common in the elderly population. Um, this is the normal thickness. And you notice here how thick it is on this side. So we get pretty useful information from the echocardiogram, the ultrasound of the heart. And the valves, I get a close look at, see if they're leaking or not, or narrow. And the right ventricle, the size of it, so pretty useful test. My references, and thank you so much for your attention. I hope you did learn um, quite a bit and share the information um, to th those who may not have been here tonight. So we'd like to thank Dr. Bean for um, giving us a little bit of insight of um, heart disease. And there is a correlation between heart disease and dementia. I'm not sure if any of you have heard about vascular dementia. So that also is a type of dementia and it affects a lot of persons, especially after they've had a stroke or heart, um, a heart attack. Kind of thing. Um, anyone have any questions for Dr. Okay. Um, I have any questions? Um, yes, you mentioned the on it is. That wasn't an extensive list. That was just a few examples of coconut oil. I know it, there was some data coming out that was harmful pretty recently, but by and large, that was sort of um, distributed. So yes, it is healthy. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Any more uh, questions? Oh. Yeah, any relationship to thickening and uh, inflammation? Yes, there is. Um, there's conditions called cardiac amyloidosis. It's like a protein being deposited into the left ventricle, causing it to be thick. Um, that's one process. Um, inflammation itself, patients with SLE, systemic lupus erythematosus, might get fluid around the heart, but specific to those conditions, no. I would say it's more um, cardiac amyloidosis and these conditions that infiltrate into the left ventricle, the muscles of the left ventricle. Mm -hmm. Any more questions for Dr. Mead? Okay. 
I'm sure we had breakfast this morning. A very pleasant good evening to one and all. And we had lunch, right? Good evening to one and all. Okay, now we sound like we had something to eat. Okay, so I just want you to repeat these words with me. We remember when they can no longer remember. Let's say that. We remember when they can no longer remember. Okay, let's say it again like we mean it. We remember, we remember when they can no longer remember. Okay, my name is Tadia Smith. I, well, where should I start? I studied medicine in Cuba. I returned in 2013, and I've been at the St. John Hospice even prior to that. Um, and after that, no. I was at the St. John Hospice after that. I came back, I did some volunteer work. Then I went to NSA Medical Center, also did some volunteer work went off to do my internship in St. Lucia, came back um, with the St. John Hospice, also with NSA. Now I am currently at, still volunteering at the St. John Hospice, still doing some work at NSA, I'm there on Wednesdays, and during the week I am at the Dawood Building, um, self-employed, so my business is Trinity Medical Services. Also I am on the radio on Wednesday evenings, Healthy Living, I am Dr. Goldsmith, <laughs> so I'm uh, just putting it out there for persons wondering who that person is. Yes, that's me. And this evening I will be talking a little bit about dementia. Also, as Nurse Trudy Ann said, that Alzheimer's Month is the month of September. Alzheimer's Day will be acknowledged on the 21st of this month. And we're hoping to do something special. So when that comes out, I hope all of you here and more will be a part of it. Okay, um, we're having some issues with the presentation. <laughs> so if you don't mind, we're not going to go through that. I'll just go through and try to make it as interactive as possible. Is that okay with you? Okay, and the title of my presentation is, Let Me See You Smile. So can we do that? <laughs> Come on. Yes, okay. So I just want to share with you some facts. More than 5 million Americans are affected by Alzheimer's disease. 5 million Americans. So that excludes, let's say, the Caribbean and the non-American territories. So we know that there are more persons. Fact, each minute there's a new diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. A minute has 60 seconds, so do the math. Alzheimer's disease is on the rampage. Alzheimer's disease is the sixth leading cause of death. Six. Dr. Mead spoke about heart, coronary heart disease. And what I usually say, what is good for the heart is also good for the brain. So everything Dr. Mead said, just try to use it for your brain as well. It works. One in three seniors with Alzheimer's disease or other form of dementia, so we have one in three seniors die of Alzheimer's disease or some other form of dementia. Alzheimer's disease leads to disability. Once you're diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, you know sometimes they get to that stage where they can do nothing, they can't even speak. And sometimes you have to try to understand what they're going through and trying to say. By 2050, the numbers would have quadrupled, leading to about one billion persons worldwide with Alzheimer's disease. Half to two thirds of nursing home patients have Alzheimer's disease. And sadly, there's no cure for Alzheimer's disease. So those are some facts. Now we want to give a brief definition of dementia because you, I'm sure you've heard dementia, I'm sure you've heard Alzheimer's, and sometimes you may get a bit confused. Now dementia is the umbrella term. So everything falls under, you know that umbrella when you open it? 
So dementia is basically that umbrella. Dementia is an umbrella term that describes a collection or a group of symptoms that relates to a decline in cognitive. So you have some cognitive decline. You have also a decline in memory and the skills, cognitive skills, certain things that you were able to do when you were okay, you're not able to do it now because you are diagnosed with some form of dementia. These symptoms can reach to severity, causing one to lose him or herself. Imagine, you are okay today, couple years down the line, let's say a decade passes, and you don't know who you are. Imagine you're married to someone for 52 years, and one day they get up and ask you, who are you? It sounds funny, but it is true. It is really true. So it causes one to lose him or herself to the disease and making it difficult to complete simple everyday tasks, how to feed him or herself, how to bathe, how to do even walk, little simple things that they would be able to do before diagnosis of one of the form of dementia. Now Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia. It accounts for more than 60 to 70 percent of all the um, diagnosed cases. And this is also followed by vascular dementia, which Dr. Mead spoke of, strokes, anything that is causing a decline to the blood, causing blood flow, reduction, reduction of blood flow, and this can result in a stroke. To be diagnosed with dementia, at least two of the following cognitive areas are affected. You have memory loss, which I said earlier, communication skills, behavioral patterns, you find some abnormal behaviors, also concentration, reasoning, judgment, visual perception, all these things can be affected having dementia. Or one of the form which the most common is Alzheimer's. This evening's presentation, I want to look at Alzheimer's <coughs> from not the patient's point of view, but from the caregiver's point of view. Because we are the caregivers. Most of the Alzheimer's patients are being cared for by family. Most of the Alzheimer's patients are being cared for by untrained family members. They don't understand. They have no clue what they're doing. But because they love the person, they do what they can to help that person. So who is a caregiver? A caregiver or curer is an, or he, he or she can be paid or unpaid. Remember I said earlier, most of these persons, they're unpaid. They're just doing it for love of the person. Care, caregiver, either paid or unpaid, is a member of, persons, member of person's social network who help them with activities of daily living. Caregiving is the most common use um, address to address impairment related to old age, disability, diseases, or even mental disorders. Some more facts. Caregiving for most dementia patients done by untrained family members. The burden placed on family and caregivers is an enormous one. It's a big thing. You know, imagine you're caring for somebody who does not even have Alzheimer's, who's just old, an elderly person. It's a lot of work. But when you have to care for someone who has Alzheimer's disease, it is more added to your much low burden. It's a loaded burden there. So when you're thinking of it, it's like, Sometimes you get to the point, this is just too much. I can't do it anymore. And it's not because you don't love the person. It's not because you love them less because you're taking care of them. It's just because you have reached to a status or a stage where it is just totally exhausted. Another fact. With time, caregivers are at an increased risk of depression, psychosis, substance abuse, other non-communicable diseases, for example, if that person who is caring for a dementia patient has, for example, diabetes, which we spoke about earlier, they may be so intent on trying to help this person and they may not be able to take care of themselves, so they neglect themselves, not taking their medicines, not doing what they're supposed to be doing for themselves, and then the diabetes gets out of control. They have to end up in the hospital or they end up with some other complication of diabetes. Approximately 65 to 75% of caregivers do not understand dementia, but because they love the person, they do it. 
caregivers burnout. Now, when you think of stress relating to coping mechanisms, you have to deal with that person on a day-to-day -day basis. Today, he or she may be fine, but tomorrow is like something just, I don't know, it's like you're dealing with the devil out of hell, just for lack of a better word. And then you realize that all this is coming down on you, it's a burden. And sometimes you find that even though that person may have quite a few children, you find that maybe they're not on island or maybe they're not able, they're here, but they're not able to care for that person. So you have to do it alone. And it is very frustrating. Personal resources and vulnerabilities. You may be sick yourself. You have some non-communicable disease, whether it be hypertension, asthma, anything, even osteoarthritis or you know something that you may be diagnosed with. But because you have to care for that person, it adds onto your disease or it adds onto your plate and everything comes crashing down. Domino effect. Illness appraisal and coping perspective, it is not always easy and I cannot use what I'm doing for patient A for patient B. Everyone is individualized because what works for one may not work for the next. You may realize that one person is at a totally different stage, stage one to three with mild dementia, and they are not engaging or they're not exhibiting the signs and symptoms of someone with stage four or five or even stage seven. So dealing with that patient is far different. But on a whole, in a nutshell, if you don't take care of yourself, even though you're caring for someone else, you will get caregivers burnout. And caregivers' outcomes, negative outcomes, can relate to emotional stress, where depression comes into play. And with depression comes a whole lot of other unwanted things. Because if you don't have a good support, you know, some people have very good family support. So no matter what they go through, there's someone to help them out. Some just do not have that. And they go through their depression, and sometimes they never come out. So it is very important that as a caregiver, you and I today need to make sure we exercise, we eat well, try to get enough sleep, enough sunlight, drink enough water. All these things are important fundamentals for us to continue what we're doing, caring for that person. There may become um, a time when you have financial hardships because you are the only one dealing with this patient and you realize that taking care of someone else is not easy emotionally, physically, nor financially because you have to buy their medication. If it's not given by medical benefits, you have to go and pay for it out of pocket. If they have to get some sort of imaging test done and it's not covered by medical benefit, you have to do that out of pocket. And let's say you are not working for a trailer load of money, a whole lot of money. You are just barely making it. You have your family to take care of, but yet you still have to take care of someone with dementia. It adds up. It increases the burden. So I just want to introduce to you a little framework called SMILE. Now the SMILE framework was designed by a caregiver. She thought that she was taking care of her mother and she realized that, hey, I need to do this because it's my mother, I love her. But there's certain things that come into play that she thought would be very good to help other people who are caring for their loved ones. It supports caregivers of dementia patients, and since caregiving is increased risk of burnout, it also helps them to try, you know, not to lessen the workload, but it tries to help them to deal with it as it comes. However, you must recognize when you need to ask for external support. Sometimes you may be going, 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 I can do this by myself, I can do this by myself, until you get to the stage where you realize that it's taking a toll on your health. You realize that you are having palpitations at night. You can't sleep. Then you realize that you are having things are popping up on your skin and you're wondering what is going on. It's the added stress. And as Dr. Mead said, stress on the heart can lead to negative outcomes. Stress on the brain can lead to negative outcome. So even if you're dealing with someone with dementia, you have to know how to deal with them. And as I usually say, 
To deal with something, you have to understand what you're dealing with. So that is why education is very important. And I am really happy that we are having this session tonight to increase awareness for dementia, to increase the awareness for the most common form of dementia, which is Alzheimer's disease, to let people realize that, hey, just because someone is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, that does not mean that person is no longer a person. It just means we have to deal with them on a different level and show them a lot of love and support. Smile, S, stage of life. Now, when we think of smile, when you think of dementia patients, you think of somebody who is basically going to get worse because it is a progressive disease. It is a degenerative disease and it is also progressive. So no matter what you may do, it is going to continue. It is just like you're taking your medication to reduce your symptoms, doing certain things to help to buffer the stages. So stage of life, you know, as a mother or a father accepts a child at each stage, baby stage, then you grow up, you reach adolescence, you reach to young adults, wherever it is, you accept that person at the stage they are. You know, when they're a baby, they're going to be doing certain things. You know, once they reach adulthood, you can't expect the same babyish things from them. They graduate. So as a person with dementia disease, you don't have to try to say, okay, I remember this person 20 years ago or two years ago before diagnosis. They were like A, B, C. No, accept them at the stage they are. Person has been diagnosed with dementia, you love them the same. M, moments. You try to create positive moments. If you go to the beach, you take them, whatever you do. If you're living home with them, whatever happens, you take pictures as well. Because, you know, pictures are a thousand words. So if you have a picture, you can look back when they're gone, and you can see all the happy times that you had. So it's important to make memories. Look for any, any, any ability, any um, possibilities to create new memories. They can't create it for themselves because their brain has already aged and the cells are dying. But you can create some new memories with them. Do something that just makes them happy. Even if it's just being silly. And it helps because at the end of the day, you want to make them happy. I is interconnect. You have to try to get persons to help you on this <coughs> journey because it is not an easy journey. As I said earlier, caregivers do get burnout. So you don't want to experience a caregiver's burnout. So you interconnect. During the times of illness, you find that people stay far. Somebody's sick, and you're trying to find somebody to just offer you know, a soothing arm, offer some word of, com of comfort, some word of encouragement, and it's kind of difficult. People just try to you know, stay back in the um, shadows. But when you find someone who's genuine and offers to help you, accept that help because you can never do it alone. L, laugh out loud. It is important. <coughs> Sometimes they may be just laughing for no reasons. Just join in. Laugh with them. They may know what they're laughing for. You may not know, but just laugh with them. Find reasons to laugh. It's important. And smiling and laughing helps with responsive behavior. So if someone is a little aggressive and you're finding something jovial to make him or her feel, you know, like, like laughing, it actually helps to bring them down, help to calm them down. E, experiment. Nothing is set in stone. You can't be doing the same thing today as tomorrow when it comes to dealing with a dementia or Alzheimer's patient. Even though a routine is important, Maybe you may be doing something today, and you try to do it tomorrow, you realize it doesn't work. Don't get disheartened. Find something new. Experiment. Because they're not able to do new things, but you can always try to find new innovative ways to make them feel comfortable, from, to make them feel that they're still persons. They're not victims. They're not less loved. And to make them feel that there's still something good in them. So. With me saying all of this, thank you for your participation. Now, smile. <laughs>
Dr. Smith for that informative presentation. Even though we didn't have the projector, <coughs> her presentation, we still got the base of what she was saying and sort of understood what she was saying. Um, and this time I'm going to ask, do you have any questions um, for Dr. Smith? I'll take the table. Yes, go ahead, please. Um, maybe you can go on Google and try to find what the meanings are, <laughs> because it, it happens, it really does happen, because they have gone back to basically childhood stage, but I think sometimes you just have to try to find new ways of getting, you know, understanding what they're trying to say. If you can find it on Google, um, simply speaking, you can try to, you know, encourage them, okay, so what does that mean in English? Try to help them to remember. If that doesn't work, then you just have to try to maybe learn that language so you can better, you know, express yourself with them and communicate with them. Right. I've thought of having someone who speaks a language, and sit down and try and at least figure out what they say so you have an idea. Uh -huh. And Google helps too. You can just go in there, Google Translate, and find what it means. Yeah. Yes, you can have a recording as well and do that as well. So these are some ways that you can do to help the communication. You can say something, sir? Yeah, this, this is going to, um, and I'm going to give you the name of this piece of equipment. But there is a new device that will translate instantly. Uh, and it, it covers They speak and they translate. Any more questions? Thank you. Okay, so again, we want to give Dr. Smith a round of applause. For that and without further ado, we shall have a presentation by Dr. Gaden Osborne. He's a neurologist at Mount St. John's Medical Center. Well, not yet. Well, not yet. Well, yes. But he will introduce himself for you. All right. Good evening, everyone. How are you guys doing? Good, good, good. Okay. Okay. So I'm Gaden Osborne, as you can see there. Um, so my education started, well, I'm born and bred in Tegan. Education started at the St. Michael's Primary. Does anyone in this room know Daisy Pestina? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amazing woman. So I started St. Michael's Primary, then um, went on to the St. Joseph's Academy. Then I went to A-levels, um, and then unfortunately, I was unemployed for two years. Two calendar years, no job. <laughs> no job at all. Um, and then something happened, I got a job at the Aid Secretariat. I was working there for a really long time. I was doing um, some really simple accounts, calculating Social Security, um, trying to create a budget for you know, the fiscal year, that, you know, that just did not interest me. So one day there was a, um, <coughs> a career fair, a college fair, and I decided to go down to the multipurpose cultural center after work. And there I met a gentleman by the name of Dr. Moreno from AUA. And um, <coughs> he told me, you know what, maybe you should apply. You know, I told him, you know, I really have interest in biology and medicine and all that stuff. And he said, apply, I got in, eventually I got a scholarship. Um, I finished AUA in 2014. Um, from that, I went on to the Albany Medical Center in upstate New York, where I did an internship and a residency in neurology. Um, that wasn't enough for me. Um, I wanted more torture, so I went to the University of Michigan um, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, to study clinical neurophysiology with a focus on EEG and epilepsy. You said you can't hear me? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Maybe I should come a little closer. Yeah. Yeah. All right. How much did you hear? <laughs> I'll just continue. So, med school at AUA, residency in upstate New York, Albany Medical Center. And then I went on to do a fellowship in epilepsy. All right. And now I'm back. All right. Very good. Very good. How many persons in this room are healthcare professionals? 
Oh wow, look at that. Good, 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 good. So my question is not so much for you guys. This question I'm gonna ask is for everyone else. When you guys hear the term Alzheimer, or uh, you hear the term dementia, what do you think? Huh? Someone said help? Oh, help. I thought you said help. Oh. <laughs> so someone said memory loss. Who else? And you mentioned crazy. Crazy. So yeah, some people would say, okay, she gone crazy. All right, all right. Brain shrinking. Brain shrinking, yeah. So definitely the brain's involved. So most people think, you know, forgetfulness and memory loss is the main thing with Alzheimer's. And I'm not saying that it's not important, I'm not saying it doesn't affect our lives, but it's not the be all and end all. And as a matter of fact, um, to have dementia, you don't even have to have memory loss. Okay, so keep that in mind. So how many people think that memory is really important? Let us show hands, like seriously. All right, so memory is really important, right? All right, um, Dr. Smith. I thought that was the first sign. Of Alzheimer's? Yeah. The most common first sign. So pers there could be personality change, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. Um, Dr. Smith, I'm going to pick on you a little bit. You went to med school in Cuba? Yes, I did. Yeah, a really good med school, right? Yes. Yeah. You guys had a lot of examinations. Yeah. Yeah? A little bit too much for your liking? Yeah. Oh, my. I, I think I need a mic. Yeah. So she's saying she had a lot of examinations. I'm about to ask if she had too much for her liking. Yeah. All right. Do you wish you would remember everything that you read? Not really. Not really? <laughs> Good. But I don't remember everything. That you I've don't. Heard. You don't. But sometimes you wish you would. Yes. Yeah. Sometimes we wish we remember every single thing. Sometimes we wish we had a photographic memory. Mm -hmm. We said that at some point. Mm -hmm. But there are things in life that we don't want to remember. Okay? So this year, I came home July 5th. I felt amazing to be back in Antigua. I didn't go to the beach yet, but you know, <laughs> nevertheless, it was amazing. On the morning of July 12th, um, I'm a person who, you know, I'm really active on social media, not posting, but following people. All right. <laughs> so I saw a, a WhatsApp status from someone close to me, and the WhatsApp status was of a, a really terrible accident, <coughs> right? And the person died. And one of the comments in the in the um in the video was, "This one you're done dead already. Let me see what's going for the other one." <coughs> so I looked at the person's face and I was like, "Uh." But I got distracted by a phone call. And the person on the other end of the line was my sister, who said, your nephew is dead. Mm -hmm. All right? So that really touched me. And I don't know when I'm going to forget this. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, so let's move on from the mushy stuff. <laughs> um, so there's three sets, there are three individuals in this room, two of which I hope remember me, and one of which He's going to remember me now that I say this, but I hope he forgets me. <laughs> <laughs> so the two that I hope remember me are Mitzi and Howard Allen from the Eighth Secretariat Teen Talk. You guys remember that show? Oh my goodness, that's you? That's me. <laughs> <laughs> so isn't this amazing? <laughs> it's a great memory. Let's change this to the flip side. Mr. Steve Brown, do you remember me? <laughs> you don't, right? And I was hoping that. I was really hoping that. So long ago, remember I told you guys I was unemployed for two long calendar years? So during those years, so I, I, I played tennis from second form, first form, second form. I, no, no, you remember, right? Yeah. Um, so I was a little chap playing tennis, but you know, so all through the years, even maybe up to a month or so ago. And then um, during my years of unemployment, I was on the court a lot more. It's better to be on the tennis court than to be on the corner, mm -hmm. right? Right. Yeah, right? So I was on the tennis court, and we would play from sun up to sun down, and going into the wee hours of the morning. When we're tired playing tennis, we'll play football on the tennis court. 
when that didn't happen, we were playing dominoes on the shed. <laughs> and I remember one Saturday night, the tennis court was really full. We were playing tennis, we played football, and then we said, you know what, the night is young, let's play some dominoes. People started to disappear from the tennis court one by one, and Gade and Osborne decided to stay there. Gaden Osborne had no ride home, and he lived in Seaview Farm, and the tennis court was in Gambles. <laughs> um, so then I had a very good friend, Mr. Sean Brown, son of Mr. Steve Brown. And I said, Sean, tell your old man we need a ride, go home, please. <laughs> <laughs> this was about 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, and he got up out of his warm bed to take me home. The ride wasn't really pleasant because I was really, really, really embarrassed. Um, and he said something to me that stuck with me. He said, you know what? This is how people die <laughs> in the wrong place at the wrong time. So that's just a perspective on memory and forgetting. All right. So you guys ready to begin? Ready to talk about Alzheimer's? All right. All right. So in med school, um, things were complicated, and I like to take complicated things and break them down into their simplest parts and then put them back together. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. So we're going to define dementia. All right. We're going to outline the cognitive domains that Dr. Smith spoke about. We're going to explore a little bit about brain anatomy. I don't want anyone falling asleep on me, so I'm going to be very brief. All right. Um, we're going to review diagnostic criteria for Alzheimer's disease. We're going to talk about a little bit of pathology. Again, I'm not going to get too in depth because I don't want to bore you. And then we're going to talk a bit about treatment, and then I'll close and take questions. Yeah. All right. Just give me a second here. All right, so we'll define dementia. So dementia is characterized by a progressive intellectual deterioration, and it has to interfere with your social or occupational function. All right? So our lady here, we spoke about memory being a problem. So if you start to forget, but it doesn't affect your activities of daily living or your social life, you don't really have dementia, all right? You have mild cognitive dysfunction, all right? So dementia is usually due to a primary degenerative or a structural disease of the brain, all right? So you can have a disease where the neurons or the cells of the brain just start to shrink or they degenerate, or you can have some sort of structural abnormality, that is to say a stroke or some sort of tumor that's compressing vital areas of the brain that allow you to function as um, that allow you to function normally. So unfortunately you're not functioning normally when these things are affected. Does that make sense? Yeah. Perfect. Alright. So this is a spectrum of um, dementia into Alzheimer's. So if you look at the left side of your screen, you see where it has preclinical Alzheimer's disease. So these patients are asymptomatic. That is to say, they have zero symptoms. You cannot tell that this person has Alzheimer's, has any cognitive dysfunction, <coughs> or will even develop anything. All right? Um, so usually you see something abnormal on a scan that you, you, know, you took for some other reason, or if this person is enrolled in some sort of, some sort of research. So this is preclinical. And this is our research base, not for us. Then you have the prodromal phase of Alzheimer's dementia, um, where you have what we call mild cognitive impairment. So you can have amnestic <coughs> syndromes, where you, you, know, you have this forgetfulness. You know, forgetting your keys, maybe not a big deal. But forgetting to turn off the stove is a huge deal. Forgetting to pay a bill. It's a huge deal. AP rate that is not going to wrap it. Cut you off. <laughs> All right? So take a look further to the right where you see Alzheimer's disease, dementia. This is where you have the cognitive decline that really affects your social and your intellectual you know, ability to, to take care of yourself. Any questions from that? No questions? Can I move on? I just saw someone in the crowd. Um, Dr. Ben Dubois, welcome. <laughs> I, I really hope she remembered me. <laughs> All right, so we're going to talk about the various cognitive domains. Dr. Smith, thank you for giving me the intro with that. 
So we have a couple cognitive domains, six cognitive domains. So <coughs> first we have perceptual motor function. All right, and this is just knowing where things are, knowing how things work. We have language. So every time I do a neurological examination, I test language. So I test naming. Are you able to name things? What is this? This is a bottle of water. What is this? This is a pen. What is this? This is my thumb. So naming, all right? We also do repetition, being able to repeat a phrase or some sort of word that's a little bit different from what they usually say. Um, fluency, being able to string seven words together to make a sentence, all right? I don't know where they got that, that magic number of seven from, but fluency is defined as being able to string seven words together to make a sentence. Um, comprehension, it's not, it's not here, but comprehension is a part of language. So not only do you need to be able to express yourself, but you need to be able to understand what people are saying to you. All right, if I talk here until I drop down and you guys don't understand it, there's no point of coming here. Maybe the AC, but otherwise there's no <laughs> point of coming here. All right, um, so next thing, learning and memory. So free recall, being able to remember events, being able to remember people's phone numbers. We have that less now because we have the advent of the cell phone. People don't even remember their own numbers. It's, you know, they say, call me, where your number? Call oh, my number again. Right? And then there's cued recall. When, you know, you ask a child, can you, can you recall what a color or something is? And, you know, they struggle a little bit and you give them some cues. It looks the same as a dog. It looks the same as a car. Looks, you know, cued recall. Um, and then recognition memory, semantic memory, autobiographical memory, long-term memory. Um, another domain, social cognition. So recognizing emotions. All right, so I see smiles on the faces. I hear you guys laughing. So you guys are reinforcing me to do this stuff. All right, you guys are helping me to present. All right, thank you very much. Um, theory of mind and insight, having insight. The lady said she couldn't hear me. What if I just said, well, if you can't hear me too bad, yeah. That's not, that's not, that's not good. <laughs> All right, so insight as to what's happening. She can't hear me. I try to speak up. I try to project my voice a little bit better. Um, complex attention. So being able to do your taxes. I mean, you don't have much of that energy, but doing taxes, um, balancing your, 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 your bank book, your, 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 um, your checkbook, etc. cetera. Um, Divided attention, so being able to pay attention when that husband is giving this lecture. Um, and then you're processing speed, so fine enough you're able to do something, but how much time do we have for you to, to really, you know, do it, all right? Um, my favorite is executive function, being able to plan decision making, work in memory, and responding to feedback, all right? Any questions on those? So when we have patients um, with a dementia, regardless of the, 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 the kind of dementia, after a very <coughs> detailed history, let me tell you something, we used, to, we used to cringe at having dementia clinic because we knew that the clinic patients would take forever. We really loved the patients, but we knew it would take forever and our day would go very, very long. Because it's a battery of questions, a, a pretty long physical examination, and then we go into some sort of formal assessment um, and the most common way, one way I train is the Montreal Cognitive Assessment or the MOCA. And what this test does is try to evaluate the patient in each domain. So we have visual, spatial, and executive. We have the naming that we spoke about for language. We have the memory. We have attention. We have language again. We have abstraction. Um, so the question for abstraction would be what are the similarities between um, a, a train and a bicycle? Can anyone answer that? Modes of transportation, that's acceptable. Um, similarities between a watch and a ruler. Numbers. Numbers. What else? Thank you. Very good. <laughs> and then we have delayed recall. So for memory, we had like an immediate recall. And then we would distract them by asking these other questions. And then we'd go back to the same um, uh, uh, things that we gave them to see if they can, you know, recall things from at least five minutes back. And then orientation, we're talking about um, 
do you know where you are right now? What's today's date? Where are you in the hospital or the clinic? What, what state are you in? You know, orientation. And this would give us a good idea as to um, their, their, cogn their cognition. All right, we're moving along pretty well. So now to briefly explore brain anatomy. All right. So this is a picture of the brain. We have four different views. So the one to at the top left, this is top right. You're right. <laughs> and I, you know, I really did pass my school. Um, <laughs> so this is the individual looking towards this direction, and you're looking that way. Um, this is in the same direction. However, it's what we call a sagittal cut, where we cut half of you like that, and look from the midline here all the way to the back. This is the view from the top, and this is the view from the underneath surface of the brain. This is, this is the view that we look at when we look at um, uh, MRIs and CAT scans. So you're looking from the foot of the bed up towards the person's head, and we're cutting it in slices like that. All right, so there are parts of the brain where I'm not, they're really important, and they're amazing parts of the brain, but we're not going to discuss them. So these areas, the, the midbrain, pons medulla, cerebellum, we're not going to discuss that. We're, what our major concern is the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex is the area with all these gyrations and the cell side, these you know, curves all over. So there are a couple of lobes in the brain that are really important. Number one, the frontal lobe is the biggest lobe, um, responsible for executive function, all right? Planning, so balancing your checkbook, paying your bills, proper judgment. If someone drops $20 here, are you going to take it or are you going to, <laughs> you know, I know time's hard, but come on. <laughs> All right. And there's also um, an area in the prefrontal cortex called the orbitofrontal region. And this is the one that, um, that's responsible for social graces. All right. Please excuse me. Thank you. I'm really sorry. All right. If it's damaged, the person loses all social graces, they become sexually inappropriate, it, you know, you name it. Um, and then there's the parietal lobe, closer to the back, which are responsible for visual spatial um, function. You know, in the early biology classes, they tell you, that, you know, the parietal lobes for artsy fartsy people, people who can draw really well. Um, uh, but Looking at it at a more scientific level is being, being able to distinguish things in space, being able to realize, listen, that plane is flying in the air, being able to see several things at once. I can see someone in a blue top and someone in a pink shirt, magenta, sorry, a magenta shirt and uh, uh, this thing. Yes, men do know colors, I'm sorry. And then there's the occipital lobe. One of my favorite lobes is responsible for visual processing. So light comes into the, 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 the brain through the eyes, gets processed through um, what we call it optic nerves. The nerves then cross and then head towards the back for visual processing, and this is how we see. All right, and then the final lobe I'm going to speak about, there's another lobe inside of the brain called the insula. We won't talk about that right now. We'll talk about the temporal lobe, which is responsible for memory and learning. All right, everybody understand that? Yes. There's gonna be a quiz after. <laughs> so, I took pride in memorizing the PAPE circuit, not PAPES, but PAPE circuit, back in residency. And this, ha this has to do with um, uh, uh, emotion and memory. Um, you guys ever, well, in you, some of your younger days, it's part of me, going out to a feather or something and, you know, smelling a perfume and it's like, Oh, I remember the first time I smelled that. It was Miss So and So from whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, so this circuit here is responsible for that. Um, it's also responsible for emotions evoked by certain things. So you may smell something and you get really angry. You don't know why. Smell is tied to memory. Okay. This is just another view of it. So it's the area of the smell, entorhinal cortex. This is connected to the olfactory nerve. All right, moving right along. Um, so we'll review diagnostic criteria for Alzheimer's. So we spoke about this gentleman, Mr. Dr. Alzheimer, who first described the disease in 1906. Um, he had a patient who um, and memory loss, paranoia, and psychological changes. 
and an autopsy, um, you noticed they were shrinking in and around the neurons of the brain. And then he started to do more research and they, they finally um, described the disease. So Alzheimer's disease, defined as a neurodegenerative disorder <coughs> featuring gradually progressive cognitive and functional deficits, as well as behavioral changes, and associated with accumulation of two proteins. One of them is called amyloid, we'll talk about that a little later, as well as um, another one called tau. All right, everyone can say that, tau? Oh. Yeah, very good. Um, so cognitive symptoms of Alzheimer's disease most commonly include deficits in short-term memory. So you guys are right when you say memory is affected. Um, there's also a deficit in executive function as well as visual spatial dysfunction and um, praxis. So you're probably going to ask me, what's a neurodegenerative disease? Or what's another example of a neurodegenerative disease? And one of them you know very, very well, Parkinson. All right? That's another example of a neurodegenerative disease. Um, another possible question, um, visual spatial dysfunction. Have you ever noticed some individuals, some elderly individuals who have dementia, they may go driving when they should really not be driving, and they end up getting lost, getting lost in their own neighborhood? It's a problem with visual spatial um, uh, function. And then praxis, praxis is being able to do something um, when your nerves and sensory and motor function um, are intact. Apraxis or apraxia is defined as not being able to carry out a particular task despite the fact that you have the motor function and the sensory function to do it. So sometimes we are evaluating patients with Alzheimer's and we say, we say, you know, show me how you would comb your hair and they, they can't do it, all right? Simple, something like that, they, they cannot do it. Show me how you would light a match and blow it out. You know, most of us would just do that, right? They cannot do that, all right? So that's apraxia. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Is everyone following? Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any questions so far? No? Perfect. All right. So as we said before, I'm not going to belabor it. Six most common causes of death in the United States. I don't have any stats for Antigua yet, but trust me, once I get the ball rolling at Mount St. John, we'll have some data. All right. Um, <coughs> the first clinical symptoms usually occur after 65. So we say individuals who have dementia before 65 is early onset. So these are dementia forms. Um, you guys heard, you know, Alzheimer's is about 60 to 70 percent um, of dementias. Um, you have vascular dementia very closely. And we have another dementia that's associated with what looks like Parkinson's, but it's not really Parkinson's. It's called dementia with Lewy bodies. And then we have all other forms of dementia. All right, so risk factors. So am I at risk of developing Alzheimer's? What do we look at? So, I don't know exactly where they found a lot of this information, but they always say that low educational and occupational attainment, so, you know, not going very far in school is a risk factor. A family history is a risk factor. Moderate or severe traumatic brain injuries. So right now, I, I am not a pediatrician, but I did take care of a lot of um, peace patients during my neurology um, residency and during my epilepsy fellowship. And we really don't like these kids playing football, American football, that is. All right, there's a lot of injury to the brain. A lot, a lot of injury. There's something called pugilistic dementia, and that happens in boxers. They take a lot of licks to the, to the head. All right, so traumatic brain injury is a big risk factor. Dr. Mead um, wonderfully outlined the cardiovascular risk factors. If it's good for the heart, it's good for the brain. We go together, we work together, all right? So nearly two thirds of all Alzheimer's patients are women. We'd like to believe it's the estrogen, but we don't know for sure, all right? <laughs> older blacks and Hispanics have a higher prevalence of Alzheimer's disease relative to older whites. And the thought process is that maybe it's the cardiovascular disease, 
that contributes to you know dementia and I believe most of these um, individuals have not only Alzheimer's but a mixed dementia so Alzheimer's plus vascular dementia right does that make sense yes. yeah perfect you guys are a good crowd I love you guys <laughs> all right so genetics so most of the Alzheimer's you see around is sporadic meaning it, it just happens there's no strict Mendelian genetics so it's not oh mommy had it and daddy had it so I have maybe a 25% chance it doesn't work that way. <laughs> okay. So the most common, the most established genetic risk factor is this gene, apolipoprotein gene E4. All right. And you know, we don't test for this be because you don't need it to have Alzheimer's. And if you have it, it doesn't mean you're going to get it. So why look for it, right? However, what we can say is if you have one copy of this gene in your genome, you're um, three times more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. And if you have two, you're fifth, you're, you know, you have a 15 fold risk and that's all that. Mm -hmm. All right. So now we speak about Alzheimer's in younger individuals. And I heard someone saying as young as 40, you can get Alzheimer's as young as 30, all right, in your 30s. So this is severe, it's rare, it's autosomal dominant, meaning you will see it in every generation, all right, that's an inheritance pattern. Um, multiple family me uh, members will be affected. So if someone gets freaked out, you know, I said, Dr. Osman said that, you know, multiple, that, you know, there's a weird, chance of Alzheimer's in individuals with fam familial Alzheimer's, you have to have multiple family members affected, not just grandma and maybe a great, great, great uncle at some point. No, it's grandma, it's aunt, it's sister, like every generation. Um, so the genetic mutations, there's three genes, all right? There's an amyloid pre pre precursor protein called APP, all right? Um, that is on chromosome 21. There are 23 chromosomes. This is on number 21. And the reason I mentioned chromosome 21 is because persons with Down syndrome, yeah. they are at the higher risk of get developing early onset um, dementia. All right. So persons with Down syndrome have three chromosome 21s, and each of those chromosomes are risk factor for you know, getting dementia. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good. And then we have two other genes, presenilin 1 and presenilin 2. These are on chromosomes 14 and 1, respectively. So these increase the levels of this bad protein. Remember, we saw this bad protein earlier, beta amyloid. So it, it, this, these genes increase the levels of those proteins. Uh, oh, I, I thought someone was blowing their nose initially. <laughs> So, and as we said, two, it's just 2% two of the dementia, all right? So the good news is that it's, you know, this early onset really bad Alzheimer's that can catch you at age 30 is just 2%. But when it's you, it's 100%. Who cares? All right. So DSM-5, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, um, diagnostic criteria for dementia and cognitive dysfunction. So things really start at mild, very mild neurocognitive dysfunction, and this is called a cognitive decline in one or more domains. Remember, we spoke about the six cognitive domains, memory, attention, executive function, language, that kind of stuff. So you need one or more of those affected. It should not interfere with your independence. All right, so if it doesn't affect you, you're just, you know, forgetting phone numbers. It doesn't really cause a big problem. You, you know, this is mild cognitive dis uh, dysfunction. It also should not be due to delirium. All right, so some patients, they may come into the hospital. It's a strange place. The place is dark. There are bells and whistles and all these beepers going off. And then their nurse is talking and the other patients being belligerent. If someone is agitated because of that or if they forget something, then you can't really say this poor person has a, um, a mild cognitive dysfunction or dementia, mm -hmm. all right? So usually I'm going to take, so I'm going to take what I learned in residency and my practices in residency, bring them to Mount St. John, okay? You cannot, you cannot evaluate someone in the hospital setting 
for dementia. It just doesn't work. You need them in the outpatient setting. Mm -hmm. All right? Um, oh, and it should not be due to um, any other mental disorder. All right? So if you have schizophrenia, mm -hmm. and someone said, you know, you know, someone thinks she's crazy, you know, there, there's psychotic features and there's there, there delusions, and you also see a little bit of that in dementia. Um, you just have to be very careful and rule out everything else. All right, there are also reversible causes of dementia. Um, there's pseudo dementia, where pseudo means false, so not real dementia, so what looks like dementia but really not. And that can be caused by depression. If I am depressed, my nephew died, or I, I failed the test, or I, you know, one of my friends is not talking to me, or, well, I mean, who cares about that? But anyway, <laughs> if I'm depressed, I'm not going to remember everything. I'm not going to be functioning on top 10. I personally, when I'm depressed, I don't eat. So now that you see me gaining weight, I'm not depressed, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> so then there's major neurocognitive um, uh, dysfunction. We have a significant cognitive decline um, in two or more of those domains, all right? And this interferes with independence, okay? And you must also rule out other causes. All right, so dementia syndrome, there must be objective cognitive behavioral impairment in at least two of the following. Memory, reasoning and handling complex tasks, visual spatial abilities, language function, personality, behavior, or comportment. So remember that test that I showed you, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment? So that would be objective, but the best would be from a neuropsychologist, all right, where the patient goes in and has a battery of tests and they can really, really diagnose some dementia. It must be a decline from previous function. So if you come to the doctor with your husband or wife and you say, you know, they, they can't help our 14-year-old child with his algebra. Well, could they do algebra before? <laughs> you know, there must be a decline, that decline from previous function. And it must cause functional impairment. Does that make sense? Yes. Perfect. All right. So for probable Alzheimer's disease, um, you must meet the criteria that we spoke of just now. In addition, um, it must be an insidious onset. What that means is you won't be able to pinpoint the exact time when this happens, all right? It's just so subtle that you just don't know exactly when. That's insidious. Um, it must be a gradual pro progression. We're talking about months to years. So if we're talking about days to weeks, you've got to really evaluate that patient for a rapidly progressive dementia, and these are really, really bad, okay? Um, initial symptoms, so they can be amnestic, that is to say, you know, with memory, or non-amnestic, so language function, executive function is gone. Um, these last two lines are just saying um, there must be no other general medical condition so if someone is in the hospital and they have a really bad pneumonia or a urinary tract infection, so urinary tract infections are really common in the elderly, you know, these can make them go wacky just to, you know, for uh, lack of a better expression, all right? You can't evaluate the patient for the d dementia. No, treat the urinary tract infection and then we'll see how they respond and then we'll talk about, you know, neuropsychiatric problems. Um, so psychiatric, if this person is schizophrenic, then maybe the, 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 the cause with his new behavior is, uh, you know, the advance of uh, in the, in the natural progression of the schizophrenia, and maybe we need to ramp up the medications. Um, and then we have positive biomarkers. I, I'm not, I don't think we have them in Antigua. I'm just going to be frank with you. Hopefully at some point we get them. Um, but here's a really fancy imaging that we'll look at in a little bit. All right, so the AAN, the American Academy of Neurology guidelines for um, evaluating dementia requires physicians to obtain structural imaging. And the image of the image from modality of choice is MRI, all right? MRI, every single patient. So this allows us not only to evaluate for dementia, but to look for other causes of, of, of this. Remember we said we had to rule out other stuff? So if someone has a stroke, it's gonna affect them. If someone has a tumor, then we can you know, jump on it and get them to oncology and get that treated. Is that, is that reasonable? Yeah. Um, 
And then, you know, presence with Alzheimer's, because we have this amyloid. Amyloid goes anywhere, and it is a great mimicker. So it can be positive in your blood vessels, and cause hemorrhage, and sometimes we see these micro hemorrhages on, um, on MRI. The last two things, uh, two lines they explain, um, <coughs> FDG, PET, and SPET scan for differentiating Alzheimer's from another sort of dementia called frontotemporal dementia. Um, the one of interest is the PET scan. The PET scan shows hypometabolism or decreased glucose uptake. So a good brain cell uses a lot of glucose. It takes up the glucose. A bad and sick brain cell cannot take up the glucose. So you'll see low metabolism. Is that okay? Does that make sense? All right. So causes for cognitive decline in the absence of dementia. You guys can see the abnormality? See something different there? Yes. So this side looks different to this side? Yes. All right. How about that? I mean, the arrow gives it away. So if you look at this area, it's a little more blurry, right, than the other side. Mm -hmm. All right. These are low-grade tumors. Not so subtle, right? All right, so in the frontal region. So remember, we spoke of the frontal region being responsible for social graces, executive function, judgment. If you have a tumor there, you're gonna, you're gonna lose it. I had a patient, just remembering, there's a patient I had with epilepsy who, unfortunately, <laughs> you know, he was a bad boy, to say the least. Um, you know, he got in some gang thing, and I don't know if he got beat up, he just met his match, and he had really bad, a really bad traumatic brain injury to the frontal lobes, and he had some shrinkage and what's that from the damage. And from that, you have post-traumatic seizures, but on MRI, you know, the, it, it was terrible, really, really terrible. But from since the, the, the damage, he is a different, he just, he's just insane. Insane, no manners, no respect for his mom, no respect for police, no one. So our clinic visits were amazing. We had a lot of fun. So damage to the frontal lobe, not good. Here we have a subdural hematoma. Very, a little common in the elderly population because naturally the brain shrinks and blood vessels get a little torturous so they can move around a little more. So any shaking of, a, of an elderly person, so this elder abuse as well. You know, getting up and shaking the, 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 the individual can lead to a hematoma. Someone who has osteoarthritis and has too much pain and gets up, you know, you know too quickly and tries to put too much um, weight on a, on a bad knee or a bad hip and they fall, they hit their head, they can get a subdural hematoma. And this can cause personality changes, can cause seizures, can cause weakness, numbness, can cause anything. Just depends on the side of the, the, the area of the brain affected. Questions about that? All right. This is also a treatable cause of dementia. It's called normal pressure hydrocephalus. Has anyone heard about this? Yes. Yeah, show of hands. Good, 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 excellent. All right, so these individuals present with a triad of dementia, urinary incontinence, and an abnormal gait. So they walk with what we call a magnetic gait, where their feet are really stuck to the ground. Like, you know, they can't really pick their feet up. And, you know, the first thing you do, you do an MRI, See how large these areas are compared to this? All right, so this is called ventricular enlargement. These areas of the brain are called the ventricles, and these are enlarged. All right, so the treatment is to do a spinal tap and take out lots of the cerebral spinal fluid, and then almost immediately after the tap, they're walking normally, and the cognition improves, okay? I think this, is, this may be better than having Alzheimer's. <laughs> this is an extreme case. Right. So this is your amyloid angiopathy. And a lot of times we pick this up is because, you know, you know, someone comes in with starts some sort of weakness or numbness and they had a stroke. Um, and we do this sequence on MRI and we happen to see that they have this amyloid angiopathy. So amyloid can be deposited in the heart, causing heart failure. It can be deposited in the blood vessels, it can be deposited in the brain. So FDG PET, FDG stands for fluorodeoxyglucose. 
Um, PET stands for Position Emission Tomography. So we just say FDG PET or we just say PET scan because we know what we're talking about. And so um, a nuclear medicine functional um, imaging technique. So we actually give the patient a, you know, a, a radioactive tracer with glucose and the healthy cells in the brain will pick it up and light up, but the unhealthy cells will not pick it up and, you, and you'll see the difference on the arm on the, on the, on the, on the scan. See here, normal brain. So the red area, really nice, that's good glucose um, uptake. This area doesn't have any glucose uptake because this is just the, the ventricles. Remember, we showed, I showed you the ventricles earlier. It has um, cerebral spinal fluid. That's not going to use glucose, all right? So the brain tissue is the one that's going to use the glucose. Here we have one more step to the right, mild cognitive impairment. So it's a little bit less in this region. Remember, when we did the anatomy, I spoke about the parietal region. Uptake is less, and then in Alzheimer's disease, it's really bad. Yeah. And then they advance the technology even more, where they can look for the uh, actual amyloid as opposed to just glucose uptake. So they can do a scan, and um, areas with amyloid will will light up. So there it is. Normal, no memory problems, no executive function problems, no problems with attention, perfectly normal individual. Someone who's also normal clinically, but they, uh, they have elevated amyloid. They may be on their way to cognitive dysfunction and Alzheimer's. And then here we have Alzheimer's. Can you appreciate the difference? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So another test is testing the cerebral spinal fluid. This is the fluid that bathes the brain um, and the spinal cord. And the way we do it is to, you know, use a needle and very astutely access one of the um, intervertebral levels and, you know, extract fluid. I really hated having patients in this position. Um, it looks really uncomfortable. This is also uncomfortable for the patient because, hey, we're sticking a needle in their back, you know what I mean? <laughs> but um, it's a lot better for getting accurate pressures and what's not. And this is what this, the fluid looks like. Very rarely does it look bloody. Very rarely does it look, you know, white or turbid or looks like it's infectious. It usually looks clear like that. So in the cerebral spinal fluid of someone with Alzheimer's disease, you will detect high concentrations of tau, all right, and low concentrations of beta amyloid. So high tau, low amyloid. Moving right along, so is everyone with me? You guys are awake still? Yeah, good. <laughs> Barely? <laughs> oh man, there's a seat in front here. This is Alzheimer's um, disease pathology. All right, so this is, a, this is a normal nerve cell called a neuron. And this is the life of the cell where everything happens. Well, a lot of important things happen. There's a nucleus, there are you know, um, mitochondria, there, you know, this is, you know, there's some glucose uptake taken here. Um, this area here that looks kind of snakish is called the axon. And this is the terminal end. So neurons communicate via the terminal axons, the terminal branches connecting to other neurons by what these things that look like tree branches called dendrites. All right, so that's normal flow. The normal flow of things is to go from this end to that end. So in Alzheimer's disease, there's an overproduction of beta amyloid, all right? And between the cells, there are plaques of amyloid that, 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 that build up. Within the cells, there's this tau protein. So remember, we, we spoke about um, nutrient. Well, we didn't speak about the nutrients, but there, you know, in, in the cell, you have nutrients and you have neurotransmitters, and these travel in little bubbles called vesicles, and these vesicles travel on little train tracks called microtubules. But the train tracks need something to stabilize them, and that's the tau protein. But there's an enzyme that adds a phosphate to the tau protein and makes it unstable and then the tau proteins stick together and, ca and cause some tangles to happen within the cell and then the cells die. 
Does that make sense? A little sequence of events? All right. So amyloid deposition can happen even 20 years before the development of clinical symptoms. So if I am to get Alzheimer's disease, you know, maybe I'm developing amyloid right now. That's unfortunate. <coughs> so um, APP, or the amyloid precursor protein, so it's what we call a transmembrane protein. Transmembrane because it goes across the cell membrane. This is your cell membrane right here. This is outside of the cell. This is inside of the cell. And this is the membrane. Everybody with me? And this is the normal beta amyloid. In a person with this amyloid precursor protein, there's some enzymes called secretases. I don't know if you remember, someone spoke about beta and gamma secretases. And they cut, these are the scissors that cut the amyloid, and they end up and clump up together outside of the cell. And where the cells were able to hold hands together and say kumbaya, and everyone's in, you know, in contact with one another, the amyloid gets between that and causes fun um, dysfunction. All right? Is that, is that logical? Yes. Yeah. Perfect, perfect, perfect. You guys are great. And this is just the towel I was explaining. We, don't, we have to go through that again. So normal healthy neurons, you know, this, you know, looks like, you know, very healthy Compo um, compared to this. It's kind of torturous and we have all these, um, these neurofibrillary tangles. There's another example over here. So nice and healthy, not so healthy. So good brain, bad brain, all right. So when when the tangles happen, when the amyloid deposits, the brain shrinks. See how that looks? Not so great. Which, which one is the good brain? This one? Yeah? This is not small and neat? No? Yeah, it's, it's definitely shrunk. All right? Which is normal? Okay. A only? B? I'll be normal. Okay. Can you appreciate the loss of volume here? Yeah. Can you appreciate the loss of volume here? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Good healthy brain. You're very full. Very full here. Not so great. Can you appreciate the spaces here? Yeah. A little bit here, the frontal, over here, the parietal region as well. Can you appreciate that? Mm -hmm. All right, so when I talk about treatment, it's the home stretch, guys. So um, when dealing with patients with Alzheimer's disease, I personally, and this is how we're taught, we joke, you just don't think through medications, through medication, you're dealing with a human being on the other end. Um, so pres persons need counseling about their diagnosis and also about prognosis. Um, any coexisting behavioral problem needs to be addressed, like depression, like psychosis. Um, so I said here, vital importance must be placed on coordinating care amongst physicians, nurses, and social workers. Everyone must be on the same page. Everyone has to be on the same page. Um, appropriate oversight and safety precautions for persons with functional impairment and poor judgment. All right. Patients need to be encouraged to participate in social activities, so the more social you are, you know, just the better things are for you. Um, adult daycare centers are good, exercise programs are really good. Um, patients and caregivers should be encouraged to take part in, in support groups, so the caregiver also suffers, all right, and the people around the caregiver as well. All right, so in terms of pharmacologic therapy, there's a group of drugs called the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Um, they're called the nepazil, rivastigmine, and galantamine. And you know, for persons with mild to moderate disease, you should consider starting them. Um, side effects are important. There's some gastrointestinal side effects. Um, there's you know, a slow heartbeat, so-called bradycardia, or, or, or heart block especially in patients taking medications to, to slow down the heart already. Okay? So that's important to, to take into consideration. Um, and then if one agent is intolerable, try another one. 
the disease will progress, unfortunately. And um, add-on therapy is another class of drug called uh, uh, NMDA or memantine, NMDA antagonist or memantine. Um, and this is approved for moderate to severe Alzheimer. Um, there's a rare side effects of confusion and dizziness, but you know the caregiver should know the patient pretty well and should be able to look up these side effects and tell the doctor, hey, you know, listen, she, she's really dizzy, she can't deal with this anymore. And you can decrease the drug accordingly. Um, there's no benefit uh, for patients with mild disease for this drug. Treating behavioral symptoms, all right? Um, so first line therapy, non-pharmacologic, all right? Try to redirect the patients, have a quiet, familiar environment, put labels on doors, you know, don't let someone walk in a bedroom thinking it's a bathroom. Um, if the person becomes <coughs> aggressive, just try to redirect them. Um, and you know, use clear language when you're dealing with them. Um, and then pharmacological therapy for depression, we have our SSRIs like Prozac. Um, then for agitation and psychotic symptoms, uh, you know, for the healthcare professionals here, you know, we use the atypical antipsychotics. Some, some individuals will use the typical antipsychotics as well. However, there's a black box warning um, for increased uh, cardiovascular morbidity and mor mortality, as well as cerebral vascular events in individuals with dementia. So, should be used with caution. Mm -hmm. So, the future of Alzheimer's. Um, so, these drugs do not cure Alzheimer's. And <laughs> there are times when I had patients with dementia and I was really discouraged because I didn't really see them getting anywhere despite caregivers and the patient saying, listen, I feel better, you know? Um, so th I don't think the drugs are great. I'm just going to be honest with you. I do not think the drugs are great. Um, when I was in training, there was a, a, a neurologist, a cognitive neurologist called um, uh, Dr. Earl Zimmerman. And he was working with some other neurologists, I think out of Columbia and NYU, um, to develop a, 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 an antibody infusion to attack the, the amyloid and decrease the levels. I don't know where that is going. It's, it's far off. It's not going to be anytime soon. Mm -hmm. All right. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. Paranoia with uh, memory loss, is that considered dementia? <laughs> so remember, for dementia, we need more than one cognitive domain. More than one cognitive domain. So someone being paranoid. No, not at all. Mm -hmm. Had a question? Okay, um, as you were saying, okay, Dr. Osman, it was a great lecture. I appreciate great that. Informative. Yeah. And my question is that you're saying that cardiovascular disease it can be related to dementia. Is it a uh, vascular dementia? Is it a type of uh, Dementia? Vascular dementia? Yeah. No, this is a true dementia. Mm -hmm. This is a true mm -hmm. dementia. So usually the presentation is a stepwise decline. So um, in September of 2019, um, the patient had a little bit of issues with memory. Um, in March 2020, they have memory problems and now they cannot pay their bills. In Christmas of 2020, they become belligerent. So that's a stepwise decline in cognitive function. And that is a hallmark of your vascular dementia. And it is a true dementia. Does that make sense? Does that clarify? Kind of? How can I help you? How can I help you understand better? Okay, the fact that you're saying is so no dementia can be reversible. Is it uh, the vascular dementia can be reversible? Unfortunately, no. Unfortunately, no. So dementia is caused by a lack of B12, an abnormal thyroid function, syphilis. You know, these are causes of these are reversible causes of dementia. Maybe someone who has um, a tumor, they can get radiation or chemotherapy and the function comes back a little bit. Someone with this subdural hematoma, that bleed in the brain that looked like a little 
C-shaped thing at the edge of the brain. If neurosurgery can evacuate that, then cognitive function can come back. The individual with the normal pressure hydrocephalus, the very big ventricles that I showed you, so I said they had to do a spinal tap to take out the fluid. Cognition can come back. These are reversible causes of dementia. Vascular dementia was so stroke is the death of brain tissue in a particular vascular territory and if a vascular territory dies it cannot function so that's irreversible unfortunately does that answer your question a little clearer now i'm not saying it can't function i am saying that the brain cells that have died are non-functional yeah Um, many relations appear with dissociative amnesia. Dissociative amnesia. Okay. Um, so there's an area of the prefrontal cortex that we spoke about called the dorsal medial area of the prefrontal cortex. And that's responsible for me knowing that I'm me, sense of self. And if that's the area that degenerates, degenerates, then you can get dissociative amnesia. Is that logical? Yeah. Does that answer your question? Not fully, but Not fully. I'll ask you after. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Could you describe the difference between Alzheimer's and other mental illnesses? Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Because of a psychiatrist versus Alzheimer's? Okay, so Alzheimer's disease is a form of dementia. All right, dementia is a decline in cognitive function. So we spoke about six cognitive domains, attention, executive function, memory, visual spatial skills, language, there's one other, um, I don't remember right now because I'm on this spot. Um, so that's your Alzheimer's, all right? Mental diseases, on the other hand, more on the psychiatric realm of things, I think that's what you're asking me. Yeah. Have to do with depression, and mood disorders, bipolar, schizophrenia, you know, that is, is, is that helping? Yeah. Anxiety, that kind of stuff. And all of these can be seen in dementia. Mm -hmm. All right, they can coexist, but not necessarily the same thing. Okay. All right? Thank you. No problem. You said dementia is the sixth leading cause of death in America. Mass shooting. You think what? Mass shooting. Mass shooting. Oh my gosh. <laughs> 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 what, what actually causes the Good question. Good question. So persons with Alzheimer's disease, they cannot take care of themselves anymore. Sometimes caretakers cannot be there 24/7. All right. Remember, we spoke about praxis and apraxia not being able to do something despite having the motor function, the muscles and the sensory functions intact. So can you imagine someone being unable to swallow? All right, so fluid goes down into the lung and it causes a raging pneumonia and you die of overwhelming sepsis from pneumonia. Or people having urinary incontinence or urinary retention causing urinary tract infections, great mortality. Um, an individual who has osteoporosis, thinning of the bones, Alzheimer's disease, does not know their own danger. They get up and try to walk without assistance. They fall, they have a hip fracture, 80% mortality. Mm -hmm. Individuals over 80, mm -hmm. all right? So these are the things that can cause death in, in dementia. Does, does that make sense? Does that answer your question? question. Right, it's pink. It's pink? Yeah. That's not magenta. <laughs> See? <laughs> All right. All right. Any other questions? Yes. Between shingles and, and dementia? So, 
shingles is caused by a herpes virus that lives in your um, in the nervous system and it reactivates when we're decompensated so we may have a cancer or a urinary tract infection or we're just old and immune I mean even diabetes we all in there and there's some stress on the body the virus gets <coughs> reactivated and the reactivation it can manifest as the shingles that we know all right, so those vesicles across in a, in a band across your thorax, really painful. It can manifest in um, cranial nerve 5 that, um, that is responsible for the sensation around your eye, this area. You can go blind. You can also have a herpes infection in the brain, most commonly in the temporal lobe. That, not, that does not cause a dementia, but it causes an encephalitis, a really fatal encephalitis. So not a clear correlation with shingles per se and dementia, but all of these factors kind of play together, especially when someone has a low cognitive reserve. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and your next question was uh, syphilis? Yeah, you mentioned syphilis, yeah. So um, syphilis uh, is a microbe that is a great mimicker. All right, it gets into the, um, the, the, the blood vessel walls and it caused damage um, to very small nerves. This is why um, people have painless ulcers because if you damage the nerve, you can't have sensation. Um, shingles also damages the spinal cord and it can cause a, a, a dementia. So, you know, to be honest, we don't know why. However, if we catch it, it can be reversible with penicillin. You know, um, luckily we the last case of syphilis I saw was in residency, and I was I was not happy but proud of myself that I actually found someone with syphilis in this day and age. But I don't think it's something that we really have to worry about because with the advent of penicillin and condoms for safe sex, then um, we really don't have to worry about it as a cause of dementia. But for individuals who have unsafe sexual practices and they come into you with cognitive decline, it's worth looking. That is treatable. All right, clear? Yes, yeah. thank you. Yes, ma'am. I have a personal question to you. Personal? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> How personal? I'm on the spot right now. It's not personal, but like, <laughs> since you work at the Mount St. John's Hospital. Not yet, not yet. Okay. No, there's no contract that has been signed. Yes. <laughs> I'm not there yet. Okay, okay. Yeah. You can still under the pressure. Okay. Um, I know we don't have those kind of <coughs> institution here for those kind of uh, patient or people that suffer from those. Can you help that suffer us from? From those Alzheimer, dementia, we don't have those kind of institution in the hospital. Yeah, we don't. Do not in the hospital. Do we have? Yeah. Um, this so is where Trudy comes in. <laughs> um, I opened Kinesi in and in 2015. Um, it was because I realized for my observation during home care, mm -hmm. um, there was a high case incidence of um, Alzheimer's disease, and a lot of persons did not know how to deal with it. Um, that was a drive, ambitious drive, because I'm not raised in my age, I'm 35, so I did that then. So it was overly ambitious to an extent doing that, um, but only because. I developed a interest in it, and then what even drove dro um, was another driving factor. You hear about Alzheimer's and dementia in the region, but I realized that like, there wasn't a push so much. Like a lot of persons still didn't quite understand it. Having going to Canada when, um, when I was able to go to the International Alzheimer's Association conference. And we are in a room with what seemed like about 5,000 people, neuro, um, psychologists, neurologists, doctors, everybody trying to figure out you know, what's causing this disease. I realized, wow, well, this is bigger than what I thought. And that kind of started me investigating more about it. And so that was why the center um, was opened in 2015 to basically 
specifically care for persons um, with dementia, specifically Alzheimer's disease. Um, I do hope one day is my dream. May not be me, but I hope somebody would be able to, because having persons with, I'm kind of going on track. No, no, go for I mean, go having ahead. persons with dementia, Alzheimer's, having them in a building is very restrictive. Um, because I don't believe in restraining. Um, I believe in behavior modification and meeting them where they're at. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I always encourage the nurses to do is, rather than going like a robot and just doing what you know the book tells you, try to understand the person. So understand them as Joe, not Joe with Alzheimer's, but mm -hmm. Joe that had a history as a teacher. Maybe that's why he behaved that way because there's some similarities with the way how they would respond to you. Um, the way how you approach them, um, the tone. If you see them getting agitated or anything like that, you you know back away, um, walk away from the situation. They will they will forget. Then you go back again nicely, and because what happened, what they're seeing is a clouded vision. Um, they see danger. Um, this is just from my perspective.